This is Lecture 6 in the series Introduction to Pro-Capitalist Macroeconomics. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me clearly in the back? All right. Well, uh, in the last two lectures, I've tried to develop uh, a theory of the determination of real wages, which I've called the productivity theory of wages. Uh, for those of you who are economic students, you should realize this is very different than what is called the marginal productivity theory of wages. I won't attempt to explain what that is. But we've got it now, and the essential conclusion is that real wages depend on the productivity of labor and can uh, not rise except and insofar as the productivity of labor rises. And the rise in the productivity of labor depends upon the economic degree of capitalism and the efficiency with which capital goods are employed, both of which in turn depend on the uh, degree of economic freedom and the influence of rationality in the society. All right, now, if we can hold this theory in mind, we're now in a position to provide a rational interpretation of modern economic history. We can look back at historical facts. A hundred years ago, and even more so two hundred years ago, the standard of living of the average person in the Western world was abysmally low. People worked long hours under very bad working conditions and received relatively little for it. The explanation of that fact that one typically finds, as I mentioned at the very outset of uh, this discussion, is that the capitalists were greedy. The government did not do anything to stop them. They had a free hand. Their greed drove down the general standard of living. That explanation is utter and absolute nonsense. There is a different explanation, which is very, very simple. The explanation is the productivity of labor was miserably low. As we go back generation by generation, all you have to do is look about you in this room or visualize your home and its surroundings and think of the goods that would vanish as we went back in time. The television set goes, the phonograph, the radio, the telephone, air conditioning, airplanes that you may be hearing outside, the automobile in your garage, electric light, your refrigerator, your freezer, everything that depends on electricity, whatever good, all of the uh, modern medicines, the surgical procedures, uh, such goods as they did have, which we continue to have, like bread, meat, uh, shelter, all of these things have to be produced with ever more laborious methods. Food has to be grown without tractors or harvesters or chemical fertilizers or modern irrigation. The materials for construction have to be sawed by hand, fitted uh, perhaps without even nails. Uh, no construction machinery, no power tools. Clothing has to be made by hand. The cotton is picked by hand, cleaned by hand. The wool is uh, shorn by hand, but with scissors perhaps, and then has to be cleaned by a very labor-intensive uh, process. No uh, power looms. No railroads, no steamships. Well, that is the uh, pre-industrial world. Now, the physical possibilities of what could be produced were minimal. As we go back, the actual list of things capable of being produced is smaller and smaller, and whatever could be produced requires more and more labor. Well, that is a full and sufficient explanation of the low standard of living. It's not that the capitalists are greedy SOBs. It's that the productivity of labor was low. Now, in fact, why was the productivity of labor low? Because we didn't have capitalists who were greedy enough to accumulate the capital representing the tools that would improve the productivity of labor. The explanation is the exact opposite. It's only as and when uh, private property became secure, when people had the motivation to save and accumulate capital, to introduce improvements in methods of production, then the productivity of labor rose, and then real wages rose. 
the uh, role of the capitalists in relation to real wages is the a diametric opposite of what it is usually thought to be. They are the cause of the rise, they together with scientists and inventors, are the cause of the rise in the productivity of labor and the cause of the rise in the demand for labor relative to the demand for consumer goods. All right, now, it's easy to see why the standard of living was low. If the goods aren't there and can't be produced or can only be produced in minimal quantities, then that's it. The average person in 1810 did not lack a television set because the capitalists had them all and weren't willing to fairly distribute them. He didn't lack a good meal because the capitalists, even though he is depicted as uh, rather corpulent, he was not eating the food of 200 other people. The food was not uh, capable of being produced. Conditions improved as and when uh, people were enabled to accumulate wealth which could be devoted to production. Now the same fundamental principle, the low productivity of labor, uh, explains the long hours of labor, the bad working conditions, and child labor. The fundamental here is the low productivity of labor. If the productivity of labor is low, you can think of that in quantitative terms as meaning the output per hour of work is low quantitatively as well as qualitatively. Not only can't you produce a television set or a telephone if no one has invented it yet, but you also can't produce very much wheat or bread or uh, material to make clothing or shoes or whatever. So the output per hour is, is very, very low. But people have certain physiological requirements which they must endeavor to meet, and if they cannot produce very much per hour, well, what they must attempt to do then is to supply the deficiency of productivity by means of more hours. The hours of work were very, very long because what you could produce in an hour was very low. So it should not be surprising that the hours were long. The hours were long as a consequence of a low output per hour. And the same principle explains why a child labor existed. The children were helping to supply some extra hours to produce some extra goods to meet minimal uh, physical necessities of uh, families that were very, very uh, low, that had a very low productivity. The same basic idea explains uh, bad conditions on the job. Now, bad conditions on the job are partly explainable by the primitive state of technology. If fluorescent lighting or electric lighting of any kind or air conditioning has not yet been invented, then obviously no worker in a factory can have the benefit of such things. And the absence is not because of the ill will of the bosses. They just don't exist. Now, there are uh, other types of improvements which uh, might have uh, been possible. We have to think of improvements in working conditions on the job conditions as falling into two uh, basic categories. There are those improvements which in a given context improve the efficiency of the worker to the point where they pay for themselves. Let's imagine uh, electric lighting has been invented. Now if we can adopt electric lighting in a factory and the workers can see better what they're doing, well they'll be more efficient, there'll be less uh, damage, less spoilage, so there'll be a gain in efficiency. Now if the gain in efficiency outweighs the cost of installing the electric light, the employer will install it for the very same motivation that he'll put in a better machine. It raises the efficiency, he has a, 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 an improvement in cost, he gains by doing it. It's the same as adopting a better machine. Now a lot of people seem to have the idea that he wouldn't adopt such a thing just because at the same time the worker would save his eyesight. That is not uh, the motivation. The, Wherever there are improvements in working conditions of the kind which pay for themselves, they are adopted in the same way that employers adopt improvements in machinery, the same principle. There are other uh, improvements in conditions which can be of benefit to the workers, but which don't pay for themselves in terms of improving efficiency. Just to pick uh, an example to illustrate the point, let's suppose a company has a bowling league. 
Well, it's a very dubious proposition that that would improve the efficiency of the workers, but they might like it. It might be something that uh, they value. Now, if that is regarded as an improvement in efficiency and in, uh, in working conditions, and that is to be put in, that sort of improvement, any improvement which doesn't pay for itself through improved efficiency, is from the point of view of the employer equivalent to a rise in wages. An employer doesn't care if he has to pay a worker money in a pay envelope or he pays him, in addition to money in a pay envelope, he pays for the cost of a bowling league. From the employer's point of view, it's part of the cost of employing the worker. Now, any such uh, improvement ultimately has to be at the expense of the workers. Any improvement in working conditions that do, does not pay for itself through improved efficiency is always at the expense of the worker. It can mean that the workers' take-home wages have to be less. It's equivalent to a rise in wages. Now just think for a moment, if wages are raised arbitrarily, if our analysis is correct, what is the effect of an arbitrary rise in wages? Given the quantity of money, there'd be higher prices and unemployment, right? There'd be higher prices and unemployment. Well, what is the effect of that on the standard of living of the average worker who's getting the same take-home pay, now there are extra fringes, costs of production are higher, prices are higher, there's unemployment. His real wages are lower, right? Now, what would be required to re-establish full employment? Pardon me? Lowering wages. Lowering the take-home wages. The payment of these improved working conditions would only be compatible with full employment if take-home wages fall. Either way, the imposition of the conditions, the improved conditions which don't pay for themselves are at the expense of the workers, either through prices going up while their wages stay the same or their nominal wages actually having to fall. Now, Let's uh, keep that in mind uh, as we proceed. We can see uh, why the hours were long, why the material standard of living was low, why there was child labor, why the conditions were bad. Now let's consider how did things improve? Why did they improve? Well, did they improve because uh, Charles Dickens and uh, his sentimental readers got all upset about these evil capitalists and decided to uh, enact laws uh, limiting the hours of work, uh, giving labor unions power to raise wages, improving working conditions, etc. This is the usual view, which I think is uh, purely as mythical as anything in the Bible. Now, <laughs> the actual mechanism by which all of these things improved was, first, security of property was established, the society became, I shouldn't say first perhaps, but in the, the fundamentals were security of property was established, the freedom to keep your own income was secured, the society became more rational, self-responsible, future-oriented, the so-called, quote, Protestant ethic, unquote, which is not really Protestant but rational. This uh, became uh, widespread. Uh, scientists and inventors turned their ta uh, came onto the scene. Businessmen sought out uh, the, 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 the latest state of science and technology to implement it, to make a profit. Thus began the rise in the productivity of labor. As the productivity of labor rose, real wages rose. And this is not accidental. The capitalists didn't have the power to stop the rise in real wages. Nominal wages are determined by demand and supply. Think back to the opening of the discussion the need of the workers is irrelevant. The greed of the capitalists is irrelevant to the determination of money wages. Money wages are determined by the uh, scarcity of labor and the quantity of money and degree of saving. And now the productivity of labor is operating steadily to reduce prices relative to wages. So the standard of living is rising. This is why the standard of living rises, based on a foundation of freedom and reason. Now, as the real wages of the average workers rise, more and more workers are in a position to keep their children home longer. After all, who is it who decides whether a child will work, apart from the case of orphans? 
The parents decide that. Well, now, as the income of the parents in real terms rises, the parents have less and less need to uh, require the assistance of their children. So as time goes on, uh, children stay home longer and longer. In the very early Industrial Revolution, there were some children working perhaps at the age of four. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, children were in some cases working even earlier or they were simply dying of starvation. You simply did not have the means to support them in orphanages. You had incredible uh, infant mortality. Um, in the 17th century, some serious humanitarians led by John Locke were uh, studying how it might be feasible to teach some primitive skill to orphan children of the age of three to enable them to survive. That, that's the background from which things started. Well, as the productivity of labor rose, let's say by 1800, there might be children going to work at the age of six. By 1825, maybe it was seven. By 1850, eight. By 1900, perhaps it would be 10, 11, or 12. Now by 1980, it's uh, closer perhaps to 25. But <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> the basic point is that child labor was eliminated by the rise in the productivity of labor, which raised the real incomes of the families who then had less and less need for the labor of their children. That was what, in fact, eliminated child labor. Now, what brought about the shortening of the working day? Well, again, it's the rise in the productivity of labor. If we start out and people are working, let us say, 70 hours a week and just barely surviving, and then a generation or two later, the productivity of labor has very sharply increased, so that now, if you were working 70 hours a week, you'd be making four times as much as what your father or grandfather did when he was working 70 hours a week. Well, now you might say, I'm in a position where I can afford to consider working 60 hours a week. Instead of having four times the income of my father or grandfather, I'll have six-sevenths of four times the income and still be much better off. You see, there are, one point to keep in mind is, whoever works longer, other things equal, earns more than uh, whoever works shorter. If you're willing to work 80 hours a week today, you'll earn substantially more than if you only, earn four, uh, only work 40 hours a week. But as the earnings per hour in real terms go up, more and more people are in a position where they can afford to work less. If you have certain uh, basic requirements and the productivity of labor is very, very low, you may need to work 80 hours a week to produce enough to meet your basic minimal requirements. If the productivity of labor then doubles or quadruples, if you continue to work 80 hours a week, well, then you're producing double, triple, or quadruple your basic requirements. Then you can afford to work fewer hours and still be better off than you used to be in the past. Well, as the productivity of labor rises, more and more people are put in a position in which they can afford to work shorter hours. And most of them, at that point, prefer shorter hours. If you were working 80 hours a week, I would think that leisure would be of, of considerable value to you. You would be perfectly rational if you said, instead of continuing to work 80 hours and doubling my real income, I'll work 60 hours and increase my real income by three-fourths of double. Well, that is basically what happened. More and more workers were able to afford shorter hours, and they desired the shorter hours. And that is the basic fact that brought about the shorter hours because employers have to compete for labor in the labor market. If you're an employer and you're looking for workers, the amount of money is not the exclusive consideration that workers are interested in. They're also interested in how many hours. You yourself could consider, you'd like a job. Well, do you want a job that requires 80 hours a week? Almost certainly you don't, even if it offers considerably more pay than a job of 40 hours a week. Do you want a job which uh, is very dangerous or in which you'll be surrounded by obnoxious fumes all day? There are all kinds of factors that enter into the attractiveness or unattractiveness of a job. Well, as the productivity of labor goes up, more and more workers 
can afford shorter hours, the competition of employers for workers then starts to lead to the shortening of the work week. If you want to get workers, well, one way to get them is not just by offering more money, but also by offering shorter hours. In fact, the market builds in an automatic premium for longer hours and a discount for shorter hours. Suppose we have a lot of workers who now can afford shorter hours and they positively prefer them. Well, they may very well be willing then to work instead of 80 hours, 60 hours, and to be willing to work 60 hours for something less than three-fourths the pay of 80 hours. If you truly value 60 hours above 80 hours and you can afford it, well, suppose you're willing to work 60 hours for something less than three-quarters of the pay that you could get by working 80 hours. You'll work for seven-tenths the pay. Well, how does that affect the profit-loss calculation of the employer in terms of the week that he offers? It's profitable for him now to offer the shorter week. His cost per unit will actually be less. He'll be getting uh, three-fourths the hours for something less than three-fourths the pay. So it makes it actually profitable. Well, this is the basic mechanism by which the working day is shortened. First, the rise in the productivity of labor enabling more and more people to afford to work less, and then the competition of employers for labor and the willingness of workers to uh, work, uh, to take a somewhat less than proportionate wage for the shorter hours, which implies a premium for overtime. It's more expensive uh, through the market, uh, on the basis of the market to have overtime. Now, the same principle applies to the improvement in working conditions. On the one side, improvements in the productivity of labor, including the kinds of products available, make more and more improvements physically possible. The cost of adopting those improvements drops. Uh, if we start out and air conditioning is some incredibly expensive uh, thing to install, it has some modest contribution to make to the efficiency of production. But then the cost of air conditioning keeps falling because of further improvements in the productivity of labor. Well, at some point, the cost of installing air conditioning drops below the improvement of inefficiency that it contributes to, and it then pays to adopt it. Or it may be, even before that happens, the rising real incomes of the workers enable them to take jobs where the conditions are better and they can afford to work at jobs which have better conditions at a lower rate of pay than at jobs with poorer conditions at a higher rate of pay. Most workers today in the United States, I'm sure, in the hot summer, uh, in order to work in an air-conditioned office, uh, they would rather work in an, in an office with air conditioning at the average level of wages than in one in which they'd be sweltering uh, for five or ten dollars a week more. Well, now, any employer who doesn't want to install air conditioning has, would then have to realize that if he wants to have workers, he'll have to pay an extra five or ten dollars a week. If he had the air conditioning, he wouldn't have to pay that. Which is greater, the cost of paying the extra wages or the cost of installing the air conditioning? So the conditions of the market compel him to have the air conditioning. All right, well, in essence, then, the whole uh, range of improvements higher real wages, shorter hours, abolition of child labor, improvement in working conditions. These are all consequences of the rise in the productivity of labor, not of legislation. Now, at the same time that these developments were going on, there were uh, legislative interferences being made. But the effect of the legislative interference is either that it's unnecessary, either it's just ratifying what the market is already doing, or to the extent that the legislation is ahead of the market, it is positively harmful. If the market itself is bringing about a reduction in the hours of work, and the law merely ratifies what the market has already accomplished, the law is of, of no significance. All that it serves to do is allow uh, the leftists to give the credit to the law. But it's not of any genuine economic significance. But if the law is ahead of the market, it is positively harmful. 
And let us consider first uh, shortening of the working week. Let's consider it in uh, terms of the present day context. Now, most of us, I think, other things equal, unless we have uh, a job which we positively love, and even if you love your work, there's a limit to how many hours you want to devote to it. Suppose we were to have a law enacted next year imposing a 30-hour week. Let us consider the consequences of such a law on the average level of real wages. And then the same reasoning will apply if we think back to an earlier day if there were a law reducing the working week from 80 hours to 60 hours. Well, suppose we have the same quantity of money in the economy, there'll be the same total payrolls. What will be different is that these, there'll be three-fourths the number of hours worked. I'm measuring now the supply of labor in terms of hours. We'll have the same total payrolls, three-fourths the uh, number of hours worked. All right, what happens to the average hourly wage? It goes up. It's four-thirds. Now, the unions would think this is terrific. That's their ideal. They would like everybody to be able to work fewer hours and raise hourly rates enough to keep <laughs> weekly rates the same. Well, if we had the same total payroll spending and fewer hours, that, in fact, is what would happen. Weekly wages, average weekly wage, would equal three-fourths the number of hours times four-thirds the hourly rate. Four-thirds the hourly wage. So average weekly wage, the average weekly wage would be the same. Now, the unions, of course, will think this is terrific. <coughs> what have they left out of account? What else will happen? What happens to the output of goods? Three-fourths, all right, the supply of goods would be three-fourths, so what would happen to the general price level? It would be four-thirds, so what would be the impact on the average uh, working family if its, money, if its weekly income is the same, but prices are, are four-thirds as high? The real wages would be three-fourths. If you earn the same money and prices are four-thirds, the real uh, income is three-fourths. Now, is there anything surprising about this? If we work three-fourths, we get three-fourths. <laughs> no, it really is nothing astonishing. Now, that would be the effect. Well, now, in the present state of conditions, how do most of us feel? Do, we would like to work 30 hours if we could have the same or higher real income that we now do. But if working 30 hours means we'll have three-fourths as much, I think most of us would prefer to work the 40 hours and have what we presently have. Now, if we had a generation or two of laissez-faire capitalism, and let's say by the year uh, 2025, uh, working 40 hours, we could produce three or four times as much as we now do per capita, well, then we very well might prefer to work 30 hours and have a, a somewhat lesser improvement. At that point, the market would bring about the 30-hour week. But to impose it by law is simply to force people to do less work than in their judgment they need to do. And exactly the same principle applied in the past. If the productivity of labor is so low that in order to make what people consider an adequate standard of living, they judge they need to work 60 hours, and then if a law comes and says, well, no, you can only work 48 hours, the law is preventing people from doing the work and having the goods in their judgment they need to do and to have. So such a law is anti-labor. Now, I remember uh, there's a famous case uh, which Bernard Segan, who spoke here two years ago, uh, writes a great deal about, and I wish I could recall it. It took place in New York State in the latter part of the 90s or early 20th century. It was brought by a baker against the imposition of a law limiting the hours of work uh, in New York State. And the Supreme Court at that time upheld the baker. He claimed, yes. The Lochner case. Thank you. The Lochner decision. Thanks a lot. I couldn't remember that. All right, this is a famous case. The Supreme Court decided that the 
uh, law limiting the hours of work was a violation of the freedom of contract of the worker. And on the basis of uh, economic theory, that, is a very, that was a very sound decision. The law was objectively against the interests of those workers who decided that they needed the longer hours to earn the income they actually required. Now, I remember, uh, like most of you, I had uh, economics and history courses in high school. And the way this subject was taught, the workers were so naive that, they th that, that, that actually a worker brought suit against this law. Imagine a worker thinks that a law limiting the hours of work is against his interests. Well, that's the influence of the Marxist theory of wages. Their view is that any shortening of hours, the hours really have nothing to do with the wages. The workers are just paid subsistence. Anything they produce above subsistence automatically goes to the pockets of the capitalists. If now we shorten the working day a little bit, well, it's just the capitalists who lose. So that's economic history, American history, being taught as though it's fact, but it's simply sheer uh, the, the Marxist theory of wages. All right, maximum hours legislation is against the self-interests of the workers. And by the same principle, child labor legislation is against the material self-interest of poor families. The only reason that uh, a poor family has its children working is because they need the contribution. And they stop as and when the contribution ceases to be necessary. Now, if child labor is abolished in a period in which the contribution is important, then the effect is to make already poor families closer to the verge of starvation. Now, you might raise the question, well, what about today? Suppose you have um, a doctor who's making 100000 a year, and he wants to send his child out to work at the age of eight. I think, obviously, we would all have a very low opinion of such a doctor. And uh, if this were the only type of situation that could arise, you might make a plausible argument that this is uh, ipso facto child neglect. But then you have a further problem. Suppose we want to have freedom of immigration, which I think uh, we are morally obliged to have and which is to our economic interest. And we have large numbers of Mexicans who are coming in who are miserably poor and who might need the, uh, to have their children work at the age of nine or ten. If we illegalize that, then we're uh, making these people suffer. So I would say uh, the, the basic principle, even though there will be some uh, scoundrel type parents who can get away with something they shouldn't, uh, that even in the present context, uh, one has to oppose child labor laws. And in the past, if child labor laws are enacted, uh, where the uh, great uh, majority of people are, in fact, quite poor, their effect is uh, very seriously destructive. They make poor people already poorer. All right, and I've explained already um, that if you force improvements in working conditions, you are forcing people who can't afford the improvements to pay for something that they really can't afford. If we decided that... Uh, every factory in Mexico had to have air conditioning. Well, the imposition of air conditioning in today's factories in Mexico, relative to the cost, the improvement in productivity of labor in Mexico uh, achieved by air conditioning could not remotely pay for the cost of installing the air conditioning in most cases. Such an improvement would mean that the uh, real wages of the Mexican workers, which are already miserably low, would be further reduced. It would be a very destructive law. Now, let's consider uh, labor unions. Apart from uh, maximum hours legislation, child labor legislation, even beyond them, labor unions are thought to be, uh, very widely, the great engine of progress for the average worker. Uh, most people teaching uh, history, or what they call social science, they just take it for granted that the growth of the labor union movement was uh, critical to the rise in the standard of living of the average worker. 
Now, nothing could be further from the truth. If there are labor unions which are limited to a few industries, let us say there were a carpenter's union, a plumber's union, and just a small number of unions, then the effect is simply to create an artificial inequality in wages. The unions have the power to make wages artificially high in those occupations that they control. They can jack up wages, force employers to pay the higher wages. But when they do that, what happens to the costs of producing the products of those types of labor? They go up. What happens to the quantities of such products which can be sold? They go down. Then what happens to the number of such workers who can be employed? They go down. So there are fewer workers who can be employed in those lines. Now where must these workers work? Somewhere else. Well, if those areas are not controlled by unions, what happens to wages in those areas? They go down. So the unions could raise the wages of some groups of workers at the expense of lowering the wages of other groups of workers. Now, all by itself, I think uh, we have to infer that this represents uh, a reduction in total production. It's not just the case that the union workers will have a gain and other workers will have an equivalent loss. I think it's implied already in this case that the losses outweigh the gains because this situation is equivalent to having a society in which people had less skill. Suppose those workers who are excluded by the activity of the unions simply lacked the physical requirements to do the work in the first place. Suppose someone who could have been a carpenter and who was stopped from being a carpenter by the unions, suppose he were born in such a way that he had two thumbs on his left hand or whatever, so he couldn't have been a carpenter. All right, that would achieve the equivalent result. But I think we know in principle that we must be worse off if we had an inferior uh, intellectual or physical endowment to that which we have. And the unions are achieving the equivalent of that even in this case. So al already I would say it's implicit that uh, there is some uh, net loss here. All right, but suppose the unions uh, are, more, are, are not limited to just a few fields. Suppose they have the power to raise wages through the economy. Now that doesn't mean they have to be organized in every branch of industry or in every company. They can achieve that power if they have the potential to organize. If it's the case that all you need is a majority of workers in your establishment who decide to have a union and then you must recognize them, well then the wages that you pay are powerfully influenced by union wages. And you will have to keep your wages in line with union wages so that your workers will not decide to unionize. In which case you'd not only have to pay the higher wages but also uh, have to deal with the shop stewards and so on. So where we have the unions in a position in which they can raise wages uh, pretty much throughout the economy, then the effect is to cause unemployment. Then the workers who are excluded from the unionized fields have nowhere to go. Then they're just unemployed. So we know, already know the significance of that and what a loss that represents. But consider a further factor which is present whether the unions have power through the whole economy or just in isolated industries. What is the typical attitude in the overwhelming majority of cases of labor unions toward improvements in the productivity of labor? How do they feel about labor-saving machinery? They oppose it. They think it takes away the jobs of their members. And so typically, the labor unions actively combat the rise in the productivity of labor. And this means that the labor unions are actually as anti-labor as any organization could be. The labor unions are, in fact, out there actively combating the rise in real wages. Because if it's true, as I've shown, that real wages depend on the productivity of labor and the unions are opposing the rise in the productivity of labor, then they are actively working against the rise in real wages. There is no more anti-labor uh, institution or organization than the labor unions. 
Now, how could they do this? We, most people think the, the unions uh, certainly are well motivated, they have a problem of corruption, but their essential nature and purpose is to raise the standard of living of the average worker. Well, what makes it appear that the unions can accomplish that? What do people have to think in order to believe that the unions are able to raise the average standard of living? They think, exactly, they think that the standard of living is raised by virtue of raising money wages. That's what the unions think. The unions think we'll raise everybody's standard of living by raising money wages. Now, the net effect of their activity, the only way they can make money wages higher is by virtue of causing unemployment, by creating an artificial scarcity of labor. The real way that, that wages rise, the way real wages rise, is, as we've seen, not through a rise in money wages. That just goes on because the quantity of money rises. The real way that wages rise is through the rise in the productivity of labor, which the unions are actively combating. Now, the mentality of the labor union, let, let's say we have an improvement in typesetting. We are going to go from the old linotyping method to computerized typesetting. Now we have a union of the linotypers. Now their mentality is, we've got to protect the jobs of the linotypers and keep up the wages of the linotypers. And that's all that they're seeing. And the public sees, well, yeah, they're, they're fighting to keep up these guys' wages. Good for them. I wish we had such a union uh, where I work. Well, what's actually happening is the union is doing its best to prevent the cost of typesetting and the price of books and magazines, etc., from being reduced. And that means it's doing its best to prevent a rise in the real wages of all the workers throughout the rest of the economic system who buy books and magazines. The way that the improvement in linotyping raises real wages is not by giving these guys who, have, who are putting the lead in the machines, not by raising their money, but by reducing the price of books and magazines purchased by all the other workers. That's how the real wages rise. And the real wages of the linotypers would rise to the extent that somebody else figures out how to make shoes cheaper or bread cheaper or whatever. And maybe in the short run, some people have to get out of typesetting. You see, it may even be the case, if we think back to the discussion of the potato grower in Say's Law, sometimes improvements in productivity in a particular industry may uh, necessitate, for the time being, a fall in wages of people in that industry. If we don't need uh, a proportionate increase in output of that industry or that line of work, the effect of an improvement in productivity in that line may be that the people in that line, for a time, take lower incomes. But the real rise, the, the thrust of how the standard of living rises, is not on the side of money income, but on the side of the reduction in the price of the product. And now every time a labor union opposes a labor-saving improvement, it is actively combating the rise in real wages of everyone else throughout the economic system. So uh, the, the, the whole approach rests on uh, a, mis a, a fundamental misconception about how the standard of living actually rises. And now even sometimes you hear the unions talk about productivity. When they talk about it, they say, well, our men are entitled to a wage increase equal to the increase in their productivity. So you might think, well, maybe they have some glimmering of a recognition of, of what's right after all. They managed to get it wrong very badly. Consider what kind of improvements in productivity of labor have we had in making pocket calculators or in making computers? Incredible, right? By a factor of several hundred. Well, Suppose we wanted to tie money wages to the productivity of labor on an industry-by-industry industry basis. How much should uh, a worker turning out pocket calculators be getting paid now? Hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And where would be the price of pocket calculators? Just where they were in 1970. Now, how much should a waiter be making? How, what, what improvements in the productivity of labor have there been 
in waiting on a table uh, over the last 200 years. <laughs> I mean, they had trays and dishes. Well, you have to realize that the relation of productivity to wages does not apply on an industry-by-industry -industry basis. There is no uh, reason for thinking that as the productivity of labor in a particular industry goes up, wages in that industry should go up. The basic way that improvements in the productivity of labor translate into higher wages is through the fall in the price of the product. And in the short run, it may even be the case, and often is the case, that the money wages of the people working in the industry where the improvement occurs need to fall if there isn't that much demand for their particular product. That's the potato farmer case. The basic way that uh, real wages rise is through the cheapening of the price of the product, not the rise in money wages. Now, money wages rise because at the same time that the improvement in the productivity of labor takes place, there is also an increase in the quantity of money. What's making the average level of money wages rise is the increase in the quantity of money. What makes real wages rise is the rise in the productivity of labor. And it works in the way I've explained. Now, an individual can easily be confused. Anyone thinking only of his own personal circumstances, from his perspective, the way to raise his standard of living is to go and earn a higher income. That's true. But it's a profound error to generalize from that to the economy as a whole. And let's try to reconcile the perspective of the individual with what uh, I've been saying about the economy as a whole. You as an individual decide to work harder and get more efficient. All right, most likely, you will raise your money income. And that's fine. You're operating in a process of free competition. In order for you to raise your money income, you'll have to make some greater contribution to production. You'll have to work harder. You'll have to upgrade your skills. You'll have to be more efficient. You'll have to add something to production. All right, but let's suppose you're working in an office, and you would like to be promoted. If you start uh, turning in a better performance than your coworkers, and now you are judged the best worker in the office, then the odds are, well, you'll get the promotion. You'll raise your money income. But suppose everyone else in your office started to work uh, with equal improvement. How would that affect your prospects for getting the promotion and earning a higher money income? You wouldn't do it. Now, imagine that everyone in the whole economic system started working harder and more efficiently. What would happen to the average level of money income? would stay the same, unless at the same time there was more money. Now, does that mean that we end up nowhere? Does that mean that the employers just get us to compete against one another, we all work harder, we end up earning the same, and we, one has been put over on us? Where will the real gain be? There'll be more production and lower prices. Now, suppose half of us are working twice as efficiently, and another half of us are working four times as efficiently. Then what will happen? The more efficient will have higher wages. The less those who have increased by less, they would actually have lower wages. But everybody would still gain, and gain in proportion to his improvement. If half of us double and half of us quadruple, well, I think the average then, I'd better be right, is, uh, is a tripling, is it not? Four times, a, a, it should be a tripling. Well, prices should fall to a third. Now, if you've just doubled your efficiency while others have quadrupled, your wages would tend to be two-thirds of what they were. The half that merely doubles, well, they represent two-fifths of the output of the economy. The half which quadruples, uh, if I'm not mistaken, now represents, I'm going to lose the arithmetic. <laughs> All right, the point is, the fall in prices would be on the order of a third. If I recall my own uh, working out of the problem, those who improve by less, their wages would fall, but prices fall more than their wages. Those who have improved their efficiency, their, in greater degree, their wages rise, 
and both parties improve their real standard of living in degree that they've improved their efficiency. But some people end up making less money. Well, the moral there is uh, we cannot judge uh, economic well-being uh, simply in terms of money. Uh, David Ricardo made a profound distinction be between what he called value and riches. Value is determined basically by the quantity of money. Riches is determined by our physical ability to produce. And there can be many cases where the money value goes one way, but the physical wealth goes the other way. And a source of many, many errors in economics is to assume that whenever the money income is going down, that automatically means there's something bad. Or if the money income is going up, there's something good. You have to be able to trace through the uh, consequence on prices relative to wages. I'll give you a last illustration of that idea uh, in, in connection with married women going to work. To make it simple, suppose we assume everybody is married, every adult is married, and initially no married women are working. Now they all decide to go to work. What would happen to money wages? They would fall. If there's the same total payrolls, they'd fall in half. Now, if people stop their thinking at this point, then they think, well, these women are out there and they're cutting people's wages. This is terrible. All right, but what would happen to the output of goods? That would go up. Let's say it doubles. Now, what's happened to the money income of the average couple? That stays the same. But if prices have halved, what's happened to their real income? It's doubled. Well, again, it's the same principle. You work more, you get more. No great mystery. But observe, the way the money moves can be very different than the way the real income goes. And that should always be kept in mind. All right, uh, a word or two on minimum wage laws. Well, obviously, you all know that uh, they impose unemployment if they keep uh, if, if the minimum wage is set above the potential free market wage, then there are pe people who would have worked who can't work. And it should be realized that there are long-term effects. A substantial number of people who would be working below the minimum wage are teenagers who have no uh, work skills and no work experience. They would be uh, the main people working below the present minimum wage. And if they could work, then they would gain some experience and gain some skills, which being kept out of work, they don't gain. So the effect of a minimum wage law is to not only keep people from working, but also to keep them from improving their level of skills. And so to make them permanently employable at a, a minimal level or permanently unemployable. In addition, a minimum wage law stops less efficient people from being competitive with more efficient people. People who are less efficient can work and can compete and even outcompete people who are more efficient if they're allowed to accept a commensurately lower wage. I think two years ago I gave an example. Uh, if we had two bricklayers, one of whom was twice as fast as the other, the slower bricklayer can be the more economical one if his wage is less than half. But if he's prohibited from accepting a wage less than half, then he stopped from competing. And I think that's what Dr. Shenfield meant when he uh, made the point that uh, the minimum wage laws work against the uh, most disadvantaged people. All right. Well, I would like to draw um, a wider philosophical point from this discussion uh, of the application of the productivity theory of wages to uh, the interpretation of modern economic history. And that is that I think uh, history, the, uh, any correct interpretation of history, and this would also apply to journalism, presupposes a knowledge of the relevant theoretical sciences. Uh, I have some views on the hierarchical structure of knowledge, uh, and I, which I've obtained uh, in part from Dr. Peikoff and Ms. Rand, and also uh, in part from von Mises, who I think has some uh, important observations to make too. 
in the hierarchical structure of knowledge, theoretical science, the propositions of theoretical science, take precedence over historical reports. We have no way of judging reports except on the basis of first-hand knowledge. If you want to judge the truth or falsity of reports, you need to judge it on the basis of first-hand knowledge. And our knowledge of scientific principle can be first-hand. We can have a first-hand understanding of the principles of economics, the laws of mathematics, the laws of physics. And anything we may read in the way of historical reports which contradicts this first-hand knowledge we know must be false and then we must go and look for other facts. If we read a history which says the king took ill and his physicians quickly cured him by applying leeches to his body, we would know that that is not correct history because it contradicts our knowledge of medical science. Whenever we read history which says uh, the, cap the, the standard of living of the workers was low because the capitalists were oppressing them or whatever, that is bunk history. As I say, that's like a biblical report. The only way you can have a correct presentation of, of history insofar as it relates to economics or of history insofar as it touches upon the domain of physics or chemistry or mathematics is if you understand the necessary elements of these sciences. In my judgment, anyone who wants to be a historian must be conversant with the uh, fundamental principles of sound economics. And the same applies to journalism. And of course, he would have to be conversant with the uh, leading tenets of, of objectivism, as well as uh, natural science. Now, think about the fact, if the police find a dead body, let us say, they will apply to the investigation of the concrete fact a number of sciences. There's chemistry, ballistics, uh, anatomy, to determine what the actual facts are. Well, if we want to determine what the actual facts are in history or in journalism, we have to apply theoretical sciences. Today's historians and journalists, I, I have to restrain myself uh, for fear of coming out with some expression uh, that would be inappropriate, but <laughs> to put it mildly, they are ignoramuses. They, are, at best, they're chatterboxes. They're presenting as fact something that anyone knowledgeable in these areas must regard as pure fable. Uh, I, I go into a discussion at length in the government against the economy about the reporting of the oil crisis, which was a disgrace. But the same thing runs throughout all of the history books. And I would think it would take a, a few generations of people soundly trained in economics and philosophy to rewrite history, meaning not to change the facts, but to give a correct explanation of the causal relationships among the facts. All right, now having said that, uh, the last point I, I wish to make is, uh, in my judgment, I have, here I'm putting in my two cents on uh, the philosophy of education. I agree 100% with uh, everything Dr. Peikoff has said. I would love to see students coming out of such a curriculum, but I have to say that when they complete that curriculum, they should have a year of sound economic theory. <laughs> you just cannot live in the modern world. You have, part of education is to show you your connection to the rest of the universe, as I see it. And you simply cannot know that in a modern society if you don't understand economics. And certainly, I'll concede more importantly, philosophy. Equally importantly, psychology. But you cannot have... <laughs> you cannot have uh, the kind of situation we have today where the, the knowledge of a journalist or historian about economics is equivalent to what they've got at some cocktail party. That uh, just will not do. 
Well, I thank you very, very much, and I'll be happy to take questions uh, in the remaining time. I appreciate that very, very much. I have uh, a number of written questions that I've accumulated, but I would also uh, like to get some oral questions. One question is, um, how do interest rates fit into the business cycle described by Dr. Beekner? In particular, why have interest rates stayed as high relative to the uh, increase in money supply and the inflation rate in the past few years. All right, the relation of interest rates to the business cycle. Uh, this is a little complex. Uh, I'll try to do the best I can. Uh, we know that inflation consists in uh, an increase in the quantity of money, or more specifically, an increase more rapid than the increase in the supply of precious metals. Now, imagine that this increase is taking place in the banking system. The banks, thanks to uh, government intervention, which I cannot describe now, the banks are in a position to manufacture new and additional money, which they lend. So here's new and additional money being created, and it's being lent out. As this money appears in the loan market, people don't make a distinction between this money and money that people have saved. It appears as though there's a larger supply of savings available for lending. And the effect is going to be that the rate of interest falls. Now, once this money is borrowed and the borrowers start spending it, business sales revenues rise. As sales revenues rise, profits rise the nominal rate of profit will rise. That, and that would be the very next topic of discussion that I had down here. An expanding quantity of money operates to raise the nominal rate of profit. Now, as the nominal rate of profit rises, the rate of interest will tend to follow because business firms are borrowers. As their profit rises, they become able and willing to pay a higher interest rate. There'll be greater competition for loanable funds. And business firms are also the sources, are a major source of loanable funds. Business firms make time deposits. They buy commercial paper. Now, if a business is able to use funds in its own operations at a higher rate of profit than before, then it will be willing to lend only at a higher rate of interest. So now the rate of interest starts uh, getting dragged up. But if we keep up the process of credit expansion, if we continue creating new and additional money and it enters through the loan market, even though the rate of interest will be rising, it will be lagging the rate of profit. We can have a considerable spread between the rate of profit and the rate of interest. So let us imagine that we got the rate of profit up to 15% and the rate of interest up to 10%. Well, that's a substantial spread between the rate of interest and the rate of profit. And that sort of thing can finance a lot of inherently uneconomic and what would otherwise be loss-making activities. Let me give you a leading example. In many parts of the United States, at least until the last couple of years, people have come to regard the purchase of a home as an investment. Now, this is created purely by the existence of inflation and its effect on the rate of interest. If we did not have inflation, one consequence would be that there would be no secular tendency toward a rise in the price of houses. You wouldn't expect that year after year the price of a house would be higher and higher. Suppose, in fact, the price of new homes stabilized. 
Suppose that we could assume 10 years from now the price of a new home will be about the same as what it is today, if not less. All right, then you, you, you could not expect to buy a house and then sell it at a profit. Because if a new home 10 years from now will have the same price as a new home today, what would be implied about today's home when it's 10 years old? It should have a lower price. Houses are, in fact, consumer goods. They're slowly consumed consumer goods, just like your, your automobile. When you buy a new car, you don't expect next year to sell it for more. You expect to sell it for less. Well, in the absence of inflation, we would expect to sell our houses for something less. Not a whole lot less, but something less as time went on. But if we have inflation, it is very easily possible for the price of a house 10 years old to be substantially higher than the price of such a house was when it was new. And now we've created a financial gain in the purchase of a house. And if at the same time the rate of interest lags the rate at which prices rise, if the price of a house is rising on average 10% a year and you could borrow, you could get a mortgage for 5%, well, then you can actually make money by buying a house. Well, the investment as a whole is still a loss. What's going to happen if, if we reach the time where the price of a 10-year-old house doubles, the prices of most other things will have more than doubled because your house has depreciated. The price, of, if we imagine that all prices have tripled, the price of the 10-year-old house will not triple. The price of a new house may triple, but not the 10-year-old one. That's less. The house as a whole, relative to other things, shrinks in value. But the borrower can have a gain at the expense of a greater loss of the lender. Well, one major effect of credit expansion is to make home ownership have an artificial profitability and to divert a lot of extra savings into home construction which otherwise wouldn't go there. And a similar effect can exist in connection with inventories of commodities. Normally, if there was no tendency for commodity prices to rise, you wouldn't go out and buy a warehouse full of soybeans if you had to sell them at pretty much the same price you bought them you'd lose the storage costs, you'd have to pay interest to carry them. But suppose inflation is going to make the price of soybeans one year later substantially higher than it is today, and you can borrow at a low enough rate of interest so that it pays to cover the storage costs, and you still have something left. Imagine the price of soybeans goes up 15%, you can borrow at 10%, the storage costs are 3%, well, you've got a profit in that operation. And so another uh, major form of wasteful or malinvestment is the uneconomic accumulation of uh, stockpiles of commodities. Yes, Mr. Griffell. In your discussion, don't you have to separate the house from the land? Um, the house may be a good The land, the value of the land has to do with the state of technology and how important being near to things are. All right, do I have to make a distinction between the value of the house and the value of the land? Yes, of course. But the investment as a whole would be less so long as that house stands on it. I think a lot of creation has to do with distance from major cities, distance from where you work, which has to do with the land and not with the house. I yes. agree with you that inflation uh, is false appreciation, but I think there's genuine appreciation of land. Well, there certainly can be some genuine appreciation of land depending on where we are. But, I mean, this factor also exists and is very important. And there could be depreciation of land, too, uh, if there are other sources of land being uh, made accessible. So it's true there can be appreciation of land, but uh, inflation makes the price of houses, which otherwise would not appreciate, which would depreciate, you see, if we didn't have more money, if the quantity of money were not growing, nothing would be operative to cause a secular appreciation even of land. If we had a constant quantity of money, there'd be no reason to think that land values in general should grow. In fact, if we had a constant quantity of money and there are new areas developing, well, land values in the older areas might actually decline. 
Well, technology works both ways. Technology can reduce the value of land. For example, uh, the technology of constructing high-rise buildings means you can have more accommodation on less space. That's something which reduces the value of land. But let's not turn the last few minutes into a discussion of real estate. Yeah? Could you tell us something about your theory of profits? Can I tell you something about the theory of profit? Uh, the most that I could tell you is in the remaining pages of the lecture supplement and then the reference uh, to the dissertation. I don't know how I could give a, a, a one-minute statement that would be meaningful. I'm, I just couldn't do it. Yes? I, uh, I would like to ask a question about the phrase, the government prints the money. Yeah. Uh, I guess I want a concrete. How, exactly how does the, the government do this? By what process? Okay, good question. The expression, the government printing the money, is really a shorthand. In the old days, before uh, the banking system was so significant, the government would simply just print the money. They would take paper and run it through a press, and that would be all there was to it. Now, that still happens, but uh, the, more, th the bulk of the money supply is not paper currency. It is checking deposits. And the government itself has checking accounts. The United States government has checking accounts with the Federal Reserve banks. And it also has checking accounts with many of the leading banks across the country. The basic mechanism by which the money supply is increased is the Federal Reserve System, which is the government's bank, is able both to print currency and to credit checking accounts. The, Fe the Federal Reserve is the banker of the US Treasury. Now imagine you have a bank and you have a banker. Suppose you go to your banker and you say, I'd like a loan. How will the loan be given to you? Most likely, the banker will not say, well, here's a pile of cash. There you go. He'll say, we're depositing the proceeds of the loan in your checking account. Now then you can draw cash or you can write checks. All right, the Federal Reserve does that for the Treasury. Now the question is, where do they get the money? They just write it on the book. Nowadays, someone will punch a few keys on a computer and it'll say, credit the account of the US Treasury $1 billion. And now the Treasury is able to write checks. The checks go out in the mail. And people who receive them go to their banks, and they may deposit them in their checking accounts. And now the checking deposits are enlarged. People can go ahead and write more checks back and forth. Or some of them may say to the banks, well, I'd like to cash the check. Well, now the banks are holding checks uh, drawn by the Treasury on a Federal Reserve Bank. And they can present them for collection. And the Federal Reserve will then manufacture whatever currency is necessary. This is the basic way that money is created. And then on the strength of the extra money that the banks are holding, the banks under present arrangements are able to manufacture still more money. They can lend money which didn't previously exist, which they bring into existence out of thin air. Now this brings me, uh, I'd like to take a written question which closely relates to this. Uh, in your lecture on Saturday, you used the phrase 100% precious metal backed reserve. By 100% reserve, do you mean, A, a system where 100% of the currency is precious metals or precious metal backed and bank reserves are unspecified? Or B, a system where the currency is precious metals or precious metal backed and banks are required to have 100% reserve? If the latter, do you, do you distinguish between demand deposits and time deposits? OK. By a 100% precious metal reserve system, I mean a system in which the circulating currency would be coins, full weight precious metal coins, and also paper notes. But such paper notes as circulated would be fully backed by precious metal held by the issuer of the notes. So if I were to issue bank notes, say a thousand notes, saying payable to bearer on demand one ounce of gold, 
the issuer would have to have 1,000 ounces of gold. Similarly with checking deposits. You could have checking deposits if people have the right to draw checks equal to 10,000 ounces of gold, then the institutions where the checking deposits are held would have to have 10,000 ounces of gold. That's the 100 percent reserve. That means there is as much precious metal physically on hand as uh, corresponds to the demand claims. Now, this principle applies only to checking deposits, not to savings deposits or time deposits, for a very simple reason. If you put money in a savings account, so long as your money is in the savings account, you lose the ability to spend that money. You give up the power to spend what you deposit in a savings account until you withdraw the money. When the bank lends the money that you have saved, and the borrower now spends it, there is no new and additional money, no new and additional spending. You, you the saver, are spending less, the borrower is spending more. He's spending your savings. But if you put money in a checking account, you are not giving up the right to spend that money, no more than if you change a $10 bill for two fives. You now write a check instead of spending currency. If the bank lends the money which you have deposited into a checking account, now your check can be spent as money and the money you've deposited can be spent as money. So there is a creation of new and additional money. And that is why the 100 percent reserve principle in logic applies only to checking deposits or to bank notes, currency, if we had privately issued bank notes. Yes, sir, right here. What I think of private currency? I'm fully in favor of private currency. The fullest, uh, most complete gold standard would be privately issued coins. Yes. Uh, Do you have plans to publish a new book? I have plans. Uh, presenting these lectures each time, uh, one of the major values I get out of it is I write them all out, even though I don't deliver them that way. They're all written. So that's a first draft. I have last summers, uh, two years ago, and these, uh, the next batch should represent the completion of the first draft. So by 90, or certainly before the third millennium, I'll have it. <laughs> Gentlemen in the far right, I'm afraid yours will have to be the final question. How shaky do you consider the present banking industry? <laughs> How shaky do you consider the condition? I mean, is this something you have to try? Each about. Right, how shaky do I consider the present uh, banking system and to what extent uh, should we be worried about it? Well, if the federal government did not have the power to create unlimited sums of fiat currency, then I think the banking system would collapse because if you think of all of the defaulted mortgage loans and the loans to Argentina and Poland and whatever, Already, we would have had wave after wave of bank runs. Continental Illinois was the leading case. Uh, there could be many others. What stops that from uh, mushrooming is the government has the ability to create as much money as required to pay any number of depositors. So I would say, as a practical matter, because of this ability to create new and additional money, I don't think that the banking system will collapse. I don't think that there will be anything like 1929 to 1933. They'll just create enough money to stop it. But as an added measure of precaution, uh, I would not want to keep uh, more than $100,000 in any bank. Because that could be wrong. And there has been uh, a case you know, there were depositors of one bank, Penn Square Bank in Oklahoma, who had more than 100,000 who lost, where the federal deposit insurance uh, actually didn't rescue them. Now, if you are in a position where you bank more than $100,000, then I think you'd better be selective, just in case you don't know what they will do. I would say the odds are overwhelming. They'll pay all the depositors, but maybe not always. So select your bank or spread your money. Thank you very much.
This six-lecture course by Dr. Reisman was recorded at the Jefferson School Conference in La Jolla, California during the summer of 1985. For more information on the Jefferson School, you can write to them at Post Office Box 2934, Laguna Hills, California, 92654.